I'm Maya Nicholson, Internet Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for February 17th, 2024. The House is moving closer to a reauthorization vote for Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act when Republican Representative Laura Lee introduced a new bill, the Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act, or H.R. 7320. The proposed bill was the first public movement on the issue since Congress pushed the reauthorization deadline to April of this year. For today, I chose an episode from April 10th, 2020, in which Benjamin Wittes sat down with Jim Baker, former FBI general counsel, to talk about a shocking report on inaccuracy in FISA applications and the problems that led to these errors. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, April 10th, 2020. Jim Baker was the general counsel of the FBI. He was also the counsel for intelligence policy and review at the Justice Department, where he supervised FISA applications. Jim was in the hospital last week, not with COVID-19, when the Justice Department's Inspector General, Michael Horowitz, delivered a shocking report on inaccuracies in FISA applications. He's back home now, but he's got a lot of thoughts on the subject, and he joined me in the Virtual Jungle Studio to discuss his reaction to Michael Horowitz's report, what the report says, and the problems at the FBI that led to these errors. It's the Lawfare Podcast, April 10th, 2020. Jim Baker on FISA errors. Jim, so the latest Inspector General's document came out actually while you were in the hospital, not for COVID-19, but it must have been somewhat jarring to you to see it. Yeah, had I not been in the hospital already, I probably would have had to have been hospitalized uh, as a result of reading that report. Um, All right. Because... So, so first of all, before before we get to the report, you've tweeted about this, but I, I'm sure people are concerned. How are you doing? What happened? Why were you in the hospital? Yeah, thank you, Ben. So, yeah, I was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome, which came out of the blue uh, to me. And it was, you know, thanks to a, a wonderful uh, primary care doctor that I have. And he spotted it right away, sent me straight to the emergency room. And, you know, then I was in a hospital for, I think it was six days. It, you know, it was pretty, pretty painful. And, uh, and I was pretty sick. So, but I got treatments and I'm home now and I'm on the mend. So thanks for all the support and care that, uh, that folks have uh, sent my way. So I, I appreciate that. So, so I'm on the mend. I'm at home. You know, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent yet for sure but uh, well enough to do a podcast with you. So there we go. There we go. Uh, When we last uh, talked about FISA and the FBI, the state of play was that the the inspector general had issued the Crossfire Hurricane report, which included really substantial criticisms of the way the Carter Page FISA application had been handled, that triggered a more expansive audit of other FISA applications of U.S. persons, which this is a kind of interim statement about, I think, triggered by how alarming the findings that the inspector general had found in the first 29 uh, incidents that he looked at. How do you understand the current state of play? What prompted uh, Michael Horowitz to send this to to the FBI director? And, you know, is it quite as dramatic as it seems? It's pretty dramatic to me and and disappointing. And it made me angry and frustrated. I had a, a whole range of negative emotions when I read it. But so to, to sort of calm myself down and, and think about it for a second. So yeah, exactly. You, you've got it right. So the Carter Page FISA revealed many problems that were clearly unacceptable and that I'm not going to you know try to defend in any way. And that then prompted, I think very wisely, the IG to decide to do an audit of other FISA applications to see whether there were 
similar problems. And so they started on that process. And the way I understand what happened is, you know, they got somewhat into it. I think it was 29 applications or so that they looked at. I don't have the report right in front of me, but I think it's approximately 29 applications. And they found enough problems early on that they, and, and they have done this in other contexts as well, that, that the IG's office decided we need to send a sort of like urgent report, if you will, to the FBI director telling him like, hey, we, we haven't really finished our audit. We've only made it this far, but we've already seen significant problems that if you, you know, that we want to tell you about so you can start to take immediate action to, to start to address them. In other words, they could have waited till the end of some giant audit, however many applications they're going to look at, and then tell the FBI director. But it's prudent, I think, and wise from an oversight and management perspective that they did sort of this, I'll call it an interim report, but basically a, a management memo to alert the FBI director and you know the Department of Justice and, and the public that there is this underlying problem that needs to be addressed promptly so that it doesn't continue to manifest itself in other applications. It needs to be addressed right away. All right. So the president's defenders react, see, we told you FISA's a disaster. The traditional civil libertarians respond, I think, with some justice this is what we've been warning about FISA since 1978. And it seems to me the only redeeming feature of this, which is an ironic and sort of backhanded one, is that it shows that whatever happened with the Carter Page FISA was probably not politically motivated. It was just uh, a reflection of the fact that the FISA process in general is much less pristine than people like you and I expected it to be. Is that roughly how you understand it? Or is or is there something to, I mean, it seems to me the civil libertarians have a much better claim to vindication here than the Trump folks do. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I guess my perspective might be a little bit different, but look, in general, right, they found, they being the IG's office, in both the Carter Page uh, situation and in and in this audit, they clearly found unacceptable practices by the FBI. There's, there's no doubt about that. But what they have, have not found, both, both in the Carter Page review and the broader Crossfire Hurricane review, they did not find, I think they phrase it as you know, documents or uh, testimony that indicate that things were done for a political purpose. In other words, the investigation was not done for a political reason. The Carter Page FISAs were not done for a political reason, and I don't believe there's any evidence to indicate that any of these mistakes were done for a political reason. And so, you know, so in terms of the civil liberties perspective, look, I, 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 the applications to the FISA court must be full, complete and accurate and fully uh, compliant with the Constitution and the FISA statute and any other you know, law that might apply, policy, directives, whatever. That must happen. But in terms of finding, for example, that you know, the FBI was out there collecting political intelligence on political campaigns and using that somehow to assist one candidate or the other or to obtain information to blackmail people, you know, personal information unrelated to a crime or uh, any foreign intelligence purpose, there's no indication of that. So this is, this is not some type of – they didn't uncover you know, the FBI reverting – to practices during the Hoover era or anything like that. Again, I, I, I fully agree that inaccurate statements are unacceptable and could have significant implications down the road that would implicate uh, civil liberties and constitutional rights, especially in a, in a criminal context. So I'm not defending that, and I'm not trying to make, make uh, light of that or dismiss it in any way. But we just have to be clear what they found and what they didn't find. And they didn't find some type of Hoover-esque type of activity by by the FBI. They found sloppiness and they found unacceptable practices and uh, that needs to be dealt with, but they didn't find these sort of improper motives that people have been afraid of for a long time based on the prior conduct of the Bureau and uh, the rest of the uh, national security establishment back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So just to go over the the specifics of what they found and they're of course it's quite 
it's actually quite vague and preliminary. So it's, it's, it's hard to know what the specifics are, but they found that there were errors or omissions in all 29 of the applications that they reviewed in some cases, I think it was three or four. And I four. also don't that, was, that, that they couldn't find the woods file. Yeah. They, they couldn't, it was couldn't find the woods file at all, which is the woods file being the, the collection of material that is supposed to uh, support every factual statement in the, in the FISA application under the so-called Woods procedures. And then in three of those cases, they raised questions as to whether the Woods files had ever existed in the first place. Among the ones that they could review, they found that there had been a minimum of around five errors in the, the cleanest application, a maximum of around 60 errors in the uh, worst and an average of around 20 errors. And so I guess my first question about these numbers is, given that human uh, systems are imperfect by definite, you know, always, what is the number that if they'd said the average FISA application has X errors, you would have said, that's about what I ex would have expected. So like 20 with a high of 60 for me is way more than I would have expected. But I don't know like what, the, if you'd said like the average has zero, I would have said, well, you're describing a perfect system. Those things don't happen in, in human life. So what, what would have been the result that would not have surprised you? And you would have said, yeah, that's kind of about what I would have expected from the Bureau. I, I, you know, I don't know. And, and I think, you know, I think what I'm about to say is the standard that I've applied for a long, long time. And, you know, when I was at DOJ, it drove the Bureau insane. But to me, the, stand, the, the number is zero. The number is zero. There should not be errors because the FBI and the Justice Department are in complete control of every word and every number, every address, every email address, every phone number that goes into the application. And so they put in what they know. And so they should only be putting in stuff that they can back up through a document that should be accessible. And agents working on the case and lawyers working on the case at DOJ should know the case so well that, that there's no mistakes. That's just how it, how it should be. Now, look, you're right. It is a human endeavor and mistakes do happen. It is reality. But at the same time, to me, these are like a lot of unforced errors. Again, because the government is in control of the document, it should only put in what it what it knows and can confirm. And somebody needs to sit there and read it and proofread it and double check. And if you're not sure about something, take it out. Right. I, I, I can't tell you how many times when reviewing when I was reviewing, you know, the thousands of FISA applications that I that I reviewed, if we couldn't substantiate something, if we weren't sure about something, take it out. It usually was not critical to probable cause. And if it was, then you double check and make sure that it's accurate and go back and find the source document and, and put it in. So I, I, I so I'm not answering your question exactly, because to me, the number should be zero. The number should be zero. All right. So whose responsibility is it here? Because on the one hand, I say, well, this is a really hard problem to correct, right? It's line agents being careless. And so who is in a position to know that the application is supported accurately by other things that the by the other information the bureau has collected and on the other hand i say well wait a minute you got to build a hierarchy that can do that or you're not going to have a fisa process with any integrity uh so is this a, a management problem is this an agents behaving badly problem is it both and do you think it's a recent thing or has it sort of always been like this? It's been hard for a long time. And I can, I can go back to that. I first started working with the FISA process in, in 1996 when I became a line lawyer at the Office of Intelligence and Policy Review, OIPR. But I'll come back to that in a second. 
let me let me try to answer your question this way. It is it is a management problem. It's a legal problem. It's an oversight problem. It's it's multiple issues wrapped into one. That and and that is why I think you end up in certain t- in certain situations and at times with this result that we have, which again is is completely unacceptable. From a management perspective, there are are multiple participants in the process, which can lead to people believing that other people are acting pursuant to the laws, the policies, uh, ethical requirements that then causes people to not focus as much on the system as they should. And, And I take responsibility for that because in part, because when I was general counsel of the FBI, I knew how, I still know, I mean, I knew how the system worked and how it should work, uh, especially with respect to the audits and reviews and oversight activities of the, of the Department of Justice's National Security Division, NSD. I always knew that they had an oversight and review process in place to try to catch this kind of stuff as it was, or much closer in time to when it was happening, and then recommend and or take appropriate action to address it in real time. So, but let me let me answer your question also slightly differently. Because there are so many participants in the process, so you have the FBI, both at headquarters and in the field, you have the Department of Justice, multiple figures in the Department of Justice, especially the National Security Division, and you know the Deputy Attorney General and the Attorney General, and then you have the FISA Court, and then you have the Intelligence Committees on Congress, and you have the Inspector General. All of them own some part of the process. And the key to making it work, it seems to me, is that everybody in that process, all of those participants, need to think of themselves as owners and be very, very diligent with respect to making sure that this kind of thing didn't happen or and doesn't happen. And so I think, you know, there's there's lots of responsibility. Lots of people have to make sure that this thing works. And that is both the that that's how it can succeed because there are multiple uh, players in the system, but it's also how it can fail if people don't think like owners. Right. But I mean, you were the general counsel of the FBI, presumably when a lot of these FISA applications happened, probably maybe not all of them, but a bunch of them. I suspect you may have reviewed some of these FISA applications just at a guess. I don't know what any of them are. And yet I have the suspicion that you had no idea that there were factual discrepancies between the uh, application as it went to the court and the Woods file, which suggests to me that checking the application against the Woods file is not something that's rising up to the level of the general counsel's office. So I guess my question is, like, where in the process is somebody other than the person who compiles the Woods file, right, who's presumably the person who made the mistake, who is the person who's supposed to look at the Woods file, look at the application, and verify that there is specific support for the application within the Woods file? I mean, generally speaking, again, I don't have the whole procedure sitting in front of me right now, but generally speaking, that is a function that should be done at the field office. That's the responsibility of the case agent, the squad supervisor, the management chain within the field office. In every FBI field office, there's also a a lawyer, a a division counsel who is supposed to make sure that that is done and do spot checks throughout the year. But it is also partly the job of the Office of General Counsel at the FBI to ask questions about that, not literally sit there and confirm the Woods file, but but they share response, OGC at FBI shares responsibility for that. But then you also have a review that is done by the Office of, of Compliance in the National Security Division that does regular you know, annual reviews of a range of FISA activities, including the, how the FBI is doing with respect to the minimization procedures, checking on the Woods files and so on. Uh, doing, you know, it's a random sample for, to be sure. But to make sure that they're checking to see is every applica- is every allegation, every factual assertion in an application backed up by a fact that's in the Woods file. And if they don't find it, then they send the agents off to go 
find the document and fix the Woods file and so on. And so the idea is that the, the use of the Woods procedures is uniform and has been for almost 20 years now. So agents are supposed to do that. And then people are supposed to be checking to make sure it's done. There's also something called uh, the inspection division at the FBI that has a responsibility to check all this stuff too. So w- what you have here that, that is so concerning to me is that you, you have this level of error that the IG has found, which means that all these oversight mechanisms failed to, to catch this kind of thing uh, and fix it. And it's, it's, it's clearly a systemic failure uh, because there's so many damn applications that, that have problems. And so that's got to be addressed both by, you know, to me, at the end of the day, the responsibility reverts to the FBI director and the attorney general of the United States. And I don't really care which attorney general it is. I'm not picking on anyone in particular because clearly this is a problem under multiple AGs. But they have to be invested. Both of them personally have to be invested in the outcome of the of the FISA process to make sure that it works effectively. In the times, especially when I was at the Department of Justice and the head of the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review, and therefore I was you know, the owner for the Department of Justice of the FISA process, when the Attorney General, especially Attorney General Ashcroft and Attorney General Reno, they were so personally invested in this process that it made a huge difference. It made it made a significant difference in our ability to make changes to the system and to make sure that the applications were full, complete, and accurate. But it required re- their investment. It also then required, when Director Mueller came in, his personal uh, investment in the process. And so I think that's part of what needs to happen going forward, that they need to be much more personally involved in, in this system. All right. But, you know... The attorney general's statement at the time the applica- that this memo was released was to the effect that – and I don't have it in front of me – but it was to the effect that FISA abuse under the prior administration was one of the greatest political scandals in American history, and they're fixing it. So it wasn't an acknowledgment that this is a systemic problem that is – you know, something that requires sustained attention and involves uh, oversight and management and agent level failures across lots of aspects of the Bureau and the Justice Department. It was a, at least to my read, a quite tendentious partisan read on the on what led to this and what the problems are. Do you have the sense that Chris Ray and Bill Barr, and to be fair, to that's a criticism of Bill Barr, not of Chris Ray, whom I don't think issued a similar statement. At least if he did, I didn't see it. Do you have the sense that the attorney general and FBI director are taking this with the seriousness with which they should? So my, I'll answer your question directly. My sense is that the, the FBI director is. I do not have that sense from the attorney general yet based on the kinds of statements that, that you just articulated. Again, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, the IG has not found that the FBI is running around targeting people based on political interests and concerns or trying to dig up dirt in order to blackmail people to get them to do what the FBI wants. That's not what was found. He hasn't even found that the applications were deficient. Correct, right? correct. Now they He's get mere, that, merely so. found that there were errors in... Uh, errors or missing Woods files in 29 out of 29 applications. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. But you know, we don't know what whether, I mean, pres- it pres- I presume, and it looks like they're going to do a materiality review of these errors as part of the IG's reviews, which I think is a good thing to do. But yeah, we don't know exactly how bad these errors were. Again, my, my view is that there shouldn't be any errors, and there are a number of procedures and systems in place to reduce the number of errors from you know typos and this type of thing that so those those shouldn't be there and these other type of errors shouldn't be there as well but look the last time this happened when i was dealing with the accuracy problem back in 2000 and 2001 i mean it started under it was in the clinton administration at the end of the clinton administration that we had these errors and those continued into the bush administration so both uh, attorney general reno and attorney general ashcroft had to deal with this problem but, you know, there, it, look, it was, a, it was a systemic problem having to do with the accuracy of applications, not having to do with 
anything, you know, anybody being targeted again for political reasons or blackmail. They were mistakes in applications describing how interactions between FBI agents and criminal prosecutors were occurring. That was highly relevant at that time because of the existence of the wall, which we can talk about at length if you want. But so, you know, again, it, this is to me not reflective of political problems within the FBI. It has to do with other issues that are more related to a management and oversight problem. That's what, and perhaps a cultural problem, which we can talk about in terms of people focusing on and investing the resources necessary and taking their ethical obligation to the FISA court extremely seriously, which needs to be done and obviously is not being done. So to me, I just don't, I think, I think Attorney General Barr is just off the mark on this one. And if I were advising him, I would, I would urge him to reconsider those kinds of statements because if he has that mindset, he's not going to invest the time, effort, and energy to actually fix the problem. And having the attorney general laser focused on this is what is critically necessary to to fix this kind of thing. That's what I had, especially with uh, attorney general Ashcroft, who I saw, you know, basically every day sometimes seven days a week when I would take, I would personally take him the FISA applications. I would report to him what was going on. I was reporting to him about, you know, in real time, problems that we were having, issues, my discussions with the court about concerns that they had. I was, he, he was getting real time updates for years with respect to what was going on with the FISA process, what the court was concerned about, how the relationship with the court was going when there were problems, how we were fixing them. He was getting told about them, you know, again, in real time as I would bring him the applications and so on. So it was a very, very different situation than I think we have now because most of the time now applications are not signed by the attorney general. They're signed by the assistant attorney general for national security. That was a change in the statute that came along years later that I opposed because I was fearful that it would result in less attention by the attorney general on this process. And my experience was that if you didn't have the AG uh, focused on and, and supportive of you, you know, your efforts, a person's efforts to try to make the thing work, then it would be less successful. And I'm, a, I'm fearful that that's what's happened. All right. You've raised a lot of issues here, and I want to go through them one by one. But first, I, I, you know, when there are this many errors, but we haven't had an assessment of their materiality uh, yet, is the fundamental concern one of civil liberties of the targets, or is the fundamental concern, from your point of view, uh, one of the FBI's relationship and the Justice Department's relationship with the court? That is, I assume that in most of these 29 cases, or dare I say all of these 29 cases, the result of this analysis will not be as in the case of Carter Page, right, that the original FISA application was ultimately de deficient. The court hasn't said that, although the Justice Department has said that some of the renewals were mm -hmm. deficient. Uh, my assumption is that the target here is probably not been wrongfully targeted as a result of wrongfully surveilled as a part of a result of these errors. But what does happen is that the FBI's relationship and obligations of candor to the tribunal are undermined, and that erodes the ability of the FBI and of the court to be confident in what it's doing with FBI information. How would you describe like the hierarchy of things that turn on the accuracy of FISA applications. Because, you know, there are errors in Title III and search warrant applications all the time, and we don't, we don't go bananas about that. Well, we don't, I don't think we know that, though. I don't, think we, I don't think we know in a quantitative way exactly how many errors there are in those types of proceedings. There may be, and it wouldn't shock me if there were, but I would expect that there, are, there shouldn't be because of the way that process works with the you basically have you know an uh, assistant United States attorney and the FBI agent sitting shoulder to shoulder working on the document, the affidavit, let's say for a search warrant or for a Title III. And you know as they work on it together, shoulder to shoulder, they're making sure that everything is accurate. And so I think it is a different process. There are fewer players. Uh, the FISA process has to have more players because of some of the other national level issues involved. 
but you know the criminal side is just a is just a different process and so uh, one that i think is worth looking at in terms of whether there should be a different model that is used going forward for fisa applications that some have have supported and i agree with that there needs to be much more coordination and collaboration between the department of justice attorney filing the application with the fisa court and the field agent so but to go back to the hierarchy, look, at the end of the day, what's at issue here is the national security of the United States, because FISA is a critical tool to obtain timely, accurate, and informative foreign intelligence information to enable the intelligence community, the U.S. military, law enforcement entities, policymakers, up to and including the president of the United States, to take whatever action is appropriate and necessary to defend the nation. So that's what's at stake here. Related to that, is you know in order to be successful over the long run the intelligence community must have the support and confidence of the american people it must have that and it must have the support and confidence of congress as well that has to authorize uh, activities provide you know legal tools to the government and provide importantly funding so what happens here and related to all of that i guess let me say this first related to all of that the intelligence community has to have the trust and confidence of the FISA court and of the attorney general, because those people, again, play a huge critical role with respect to enabling the intelligence community to obtain, you know, timely, accurate, actionable, relevant, whatever terms you want to use, uh, foreign intelligence information. And so this kind of thing, these, these inaccuracies in, in applications, again, even if they don't rise to the level of materiality, and again, we don't know that, but let's assume for a second that they don't, they still, it just bespeaks a sloppiness, a lack of attention to detail, uh, a lack of investment of resources, ethical lapses that just are unacceptable. And so it erodes the confidence that the court has in the Justice Department. It, it, I think it, it, it would erode the confidence that the attorney general would have in the, in the FBI and other elements of the government that file these applications. And that gets out to the public, and then the public doesn't have confidence in it. And that's why you and I are sitting here talking today, uh, because this is public, and it has caused people to question what in the world the FBI is doing, and rightly so. And so that is corrosive to the ability of the FBI and the rest of the intelligence community to protect the country by getting FISA applications through the system in a prompt way. What is the responsibility of the court here? The court, after all, is it's an ex parte proceeding before the court in the face of uh, now two IG documents saying there's systemic problems with the FBI's uh, compliance with the Woods procedures should judges on the FISC be saying basically, I want to see documentation of every fact that you're, you know, basically I'm going to be your fact checker for purposes of Woods procedures. If something's in the FISA application, I want an exhibit that demonstrates it to be true, or I want sworn testimony that demonstrates it to be true, or if if there's some material that the FBI has collected that demonstrates it, whether by you know covert means or whatever, I want it. Uh, but I don't. I'm not in a position to trust the factual representations given these findings that I was three months ago. Are, are do you think judges are going to sort of shift gears and be more persnickety? Oh, I think I think they will most definitely, most definitely. Look, I mean, their obligation is to follow the Constitution and laws of the United States. That's what they have to do, just like everybody else. They play a by the by statute. They play a particular role in the process of collecting foreign intelligence information. And so, you know, the reality is that the pressure is always on the court to move quickly. But the reality is that the court also has uh, responsibilities under the Constitution and this, the FISA statute to do things in a certain way and assure itself that the, the matters that are being brought before it comply with the law and that they, they do need to make sure that these applications are accurate. So they have full authority to hold executive branch people who sign these applications and submit them to the court, to, to hold them accountable. That's what this is all about at the end of the day accountability. Everybody in the process 
needs to be held accountable with respect to making sure that these applications are full, complete, and accurate, especially the people who sign them. That's why FISA has various requirements by a statute built into these applications with respect to who has to sign them, because that's what the drafters of FISA wanted in order to avoid the kinds of problems that were uncovered under Director Hoover and, and others, so that these improprieties are not taking place and that people are personally accountable. So yeah, so the, the, the court making demands with respect to bringing documents in, bringing people in, asking questions, and so on, makes perfect sense to me. That's some of what happened back in 2001 that resulted in the situation changing. The th I guess the three most important things that happened back then were, number one, we created the Woods procedures that gave a structure to making sure that the applications were full, complete, and accurate and provided oversight mechanisms and so on. It gave a structure to all that. Number two, the attorney general ordered the FBI director to make FBI field agents available to attorneys at the Justice Department who were filing the applications. Believe it or not, the uh, DOJ attorneys could only act in, engage with FBI headquarters folks before that, and it took an order from the attorney general to the FBI director to make that happen. Uh, but the third thing that happened that was perhaps the most important, quite honestly, is that Judge Lamberth, who was then the uh, presiding judge of the FISA court, Judge Royce Lamberth, who's in the uh, U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, uh, he was the presiding judge of the FISA court at the time. When a second set of FISA applications came through that had inaccuracies in them, he was justifiably upset. And in order to try to send a clear message to the FBI and the Justice Department that this kind of conduct was unacceptable, he banned a particular agent who signed some applications uh, at headquarters from ever appearing before, before the FISA court again, which had multiple implications for that agent's career that lasted for a, a long, long time. Eventually, Judge Lambert, my recollection is he, re, many years later, he, he reversed his findings uh, with respect to that particular person. But put that aside for a second, the effect on the FISA process was substantial because it made everybody in the system take the requirement to file full, complete, and accurate applications you know, much, much more seriously because everybody saw the damage that was done to that agent's career and nobody wanted to have that happen. Fear, and I, I, fear, and I have, fear is a big motivator, right, Ben? Fear is a big motivator. Go ahead. I, and I have heard that agent's name used in bureau circles as a verb, as in mm. you don't want to be blanked, which means to be sort of blackballed by the FISA court as a result of having misled the court. I guess I, that that's a good segue to the cultural issues that you describe. You 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 say there are institutional culture features that are lie behind this partly, and I'm interested to have you talk about that. What what are the cultural features of the bureau that make this problem so sticky, and how do you change it? Yeah, it's a tough one to change, but I think, you know, the judges holding the judges, the attorney general and the FBI director holding people personally accountable is probably the way to change it. And I mean, having, you know, negative implications on the careers of people who who approve things, who sign things that uh, they haven't checked to, to be accurate if they are the people expected to make sure that they're accurate. So, look, I mean, again, I, I, I would focus on the personal accountability with respect to this. And I just reflect back on my own time when I was the head of OIPR. And, you know, I, I took ownership of the FISA process because that was my job and that's the way I felt about it. And, and I had to personally go before the judges on a, you know, sometimes daily, but certainly multiple times a week basis. I had to interact with them personally. I had to go almost every day to see the attorney general. I had to go up to Congress and explain what we had done, personally appear and, and show up. So it was me and my integrity and my reputation that was invested in this. And I, you know, therefore did everything I could to make sure that what I was doing was, was, was accurate, that the system was working, that I was investing the right amount of intent, attention and energy into this because I felt personally accountable to all of these people 
because I interacted with them personally. And so it mattered what the attorney general ma- thought of me. It mattered what the judges on the FISA court thought of me. And I did my level best to do the, you know, the best possible job that I could. So one of the problems with the FISA process is that the you know, agents in the field who are actually working on the case, who know the facts the best, who are called upon to prepare the draft applications and submit them forward to headquarters and then to the FBI general counsel's office and over to, to DOJ national security division and so on. Well, they don't show up in front of the court ever or most generally, right? They don't, it's, it's the court is in Washington. These agents are around the country. They, they don't have to personally appear before the judge. They don't, you know, generally have to appear before the the Justice Department attorney. They have interactions via email and so on and so forth. And so that that distance, that distance, I think, is corrosive and it, it can reduce the sense of personal responsibility, personal accountability. And so that's what I talk about part with respect to culture. The FISA court and process when viewed from the field office can seem kind of remote there's multiple players, there's the diffusion of responsibility. And so it's just different from when, you know, a line agent in the field shows up at a judge's chambers with an assistant United States attorney, and they ask that particular judge for a search warrant in a case that they know that if they're successful, they're going to prosecute perhaps in front of that judge later on down the road. And so it's just a different dynamic. It, it, it produces different incentives it, it causes different behaviors in terms of uh, how people act because, you know, for those of us like me who have been yelled at by federal judges in the past, it's not something that once you have it happen, you ever want to repeat, right? And so it's that, it's that kind of cultural uh, sense of personal accountability and responsibility that I think is critically important to making sure that this very important process that's very important in many levels to protect the security and liberty of Americans actually works as intended. We need to wrap up, but I just want to end on the question of whether the hierarchy is taking this adequately seriously. So in your your old role, your first old role, uh, the head of OIPR is a position that no longer exists. It's been folded into the uh, National Security Division, which is run by John Demers, We have an IG who seems to be taking this extremely seriously. We have an attorney general who is taking it seriously, but maybe for the wrong reasons or focusing on the wrong elements of it. We have a new FBI general counsel who replaced you. And we have an FBI director who, in my judgment, has said a lot of the right things. So when you look across the landscape of people who would have to show the leadership to get this done, and do what you guys did 20 years ago at the time of the Woods procedures, is the institutional commitment there to do it? I think it's there by many of the players that you talk about, but it, it will not work. It will not work if the attorney general himself or herself, in this case, Attorney General Barr, is not fully invested in fixing this, in understanding what went wrong, accurately understanding what went wrong, and demanding an improvement in performance by the institution. And, you know, he really has to dig into and incentivize, he has to dig into what went wrong. He has to dig into how it's, how people are proposing to fix it. And then he needs to message that it has to be fixed and that anything short of that is unacceptable because that kind of energy by the, you know, the head of the Department of Justice is really, in my experience, what is required to make this very complicated, resource-intensive, highly distributed process work effectively to produce the results that are necessary in order to protect the, the safety and constitutional rights of Americans. If the AG is not focused on it and focused on the right things, then it's not going to work. That's what I really think is critically important. Jim Baker was the head of the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review. He was in the Deputy Attorney General's office working on these issues, and he was the general counsel of the FBI until a couple years ago. Jim, keep feeling better, and thanks so much for joining us. 
Thank you, Ben. Great to be with you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Hey, guys, we need your help in promoting the Lawfare Podcast, so tweet this episode, share it on Facebook, leave us a review wherever you found us, and of course, if you're a fan of the podcast, leave us a rating as well. You can get Lawfare merch at thelawfarestore.com. Our audio engineer this episode was Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo. The Lawfare podcast is produced and edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is, as ever, performed by the one, the only, Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.